Arnhem de Welle te zijn, dat is uh, mooi. Um, vandaag, uh, op, volgende week ben ik er niet. Dus we hebben uh, uh, besloten dat uh, vandaag zal ik deze presentatie doen. Hij is van Arnhem, dus uh, nou, spannend. Maar ik denk dat het nog gaat lukken na uh, alles. Dan uh, na code of zo achter. Uh, ook nog leuker dag misschien. Uh, het practicum schuiven we dan wel naar volgende week. Omdat de anders dan wordt het ook zo laat vandaag. Hey! 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 Gaan we! Voor de mij bedanken. Moet je dat paar uh, bacteriën bedanken? Ja! Dat pak hebben ze dan. Of een virus. Maar ja, Oké, laten we snel uh, beginnen. Even kijken of alles goed gaat, want nou moet ik hier op vertrouwen. Nou, ik hoop dat het goed gaat, we zullen het zien. Ik zal het net als Arne in het Engels doen, want we nemen het op. Ik hoop dat het lukt. Nou, ik het hoop dat het gaat. Dat is nou vanuit. Um, welcome all, welcome all, eh? let's do it in English. Welcome all at this uh, second presentation. Uh, today we will we'll have a look at uh, data acquisition and how to do that. Very important. As you can see we have uh, static forensics and we have a short look at uh, live forensics as well and see what the differences are. Uh, The most important uh, part of this presentation of today is the uh, acquisition. Uh, that's, that, that's what we want to look at today. Acquisition is dependent on uh, preservation and collection. I would use the reverse order. I would use uh, collection and preservation, or preservation and collection. Yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult what to do first. You need to do both, and you need to do both uh, very well. Uh, collection is getting access to what you want to get. Uh, because it could be uh, data, or I don't know, it could be even uh, physical things that you want to uh, collect, where, on which the data is stored, or I don't know, it could be, uh, uh, it could be items, devices, whatever, but even whatever it is, you need to uh, collect it, and you need to get to it. And it could be difficult. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, uh, it's a good thing I look at it because I can switch off the beep because I never get a phone call except now, I'm sure. 
So for example, when the, uh, uh, when the data is on this device, my first problem is how do I get to it? Uh, this device is a little bit easier than an iPhone. If you have an iPhone, it is even more difficult to get to the data because the iPhone is uh, reasonably uh, protected. But uh, pretty well uh, protected. And Android is an uh, open source platform, so it has more, uh, there are more options to get to the data on the device. So collection is the step of how do I get it? And then when I get it, or in the process of getting it, or even before getting it, you need to make sure that, the, that whatever you get is preserved. So that for a lot of forensics is done for, uh, for court cases, yeah. criminal court yeah. cases maybe. And in a criminal court, the opposition or the defendant, is the other uh, uh, party, I don't know how you would call that, the, the one you're trying to accuse, the first thing they're going to call is, ah, but the, the evidence has been tampered with, or it has been altered, or um, if you have a DNA material, yeah, it was contaminated in the lab, the lab was not uh, sterile or whatever, they can use whatever. Digital forensics, same thing. Uh, they, they're always going to say, ah, yeah, that data, yes, of course, yes, it's child porn, but when he looked at it, she was 85. Huh? So, I don't know what happened, they did Photoshop or something, they put a different hat on, I don't know. They're going to use all sorts of tricks to make, uh, to make, to convince the court or whoever is judging um, that the data was altered or it's not the data that uh, you say uh, it was when you collected it. There are ways to preserve it, to make sure that uh, you can prove more or less that uh, the data that you show the court or at a later time is still the same data as you collected at the moment you uh, collected it. And, uh, this is uh, similar to, uh, for example, a bank transaction. Because it, I have the same problem. I can dispute, dispute, I have to watch my English. Uh, I have to dispute, I can, I can try to dispute if someone takes money out of my bank account for, let's say, a, a, an ATM transaction or a pin tra transaction, uh, I can say, well, it wasn't me. I did not buy, I don't know, a, a car or... <laughs> what did you buy? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing. Uh, I did not buy that. I did not spend this money. wasn't me. wasn't me. Uh, but then the bank, they have ways to show that, well, it <coughs> has to be you. It had to have been you. Because uh, you use your PIN number and the PIN number, there's transaction numbers and there's all sorts of <coughs> encryption going on and authentication going on. And in this process, they can prove beyond reasonable doubt that it had to be you, or at least someone with your PIN number. Uh, otherwise, it's very unlikely that uh, this transaction could have happened. And that's, but that's just another example, a banking uh, transaction. Just a lots of digital, digital examples where you have the same uh, problem. And uh, when you use similar solutions, they're all similar solutions. For uh, computer forensics, uh, this includes, so the, what, what, what are we getting, what are we collecting? Mm -hmm. Images, movies, documents, communication software, messengers, social networking, etc. Uh, encrypted files and volumes, hidden files and volumes, any credentials, uh, network traffic, yeah, the, the encrypted files and hidden files are the, as we mentioned before, the, uh, the, the, uh, the subjects, su suspects, I don't know what the right name is, but you see that especially in, a, in, a criminal, in criminal cases, the, the people are getting smarter and smarter. They're, they are in networks, you saw that there was a very good documentary not so long ago, a few months ago, on uh, on uh, child pornography on the child pornography network. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that, oh no, not the child pornography network TV station. I know. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank God we don't have that. 
<laughs> have to make sure that we cut that out because they got the wrong idea about the Netherlands. Oh, they're, they're very liberal. Uh, no, 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 no. There is uh, illegal, of course, uh, hidden uh, child pornography networks. Uh, sadly, uh, all of them are there. Sadly, uh, very uh, widespread and uh, and uh, and strong. And there was this uh, reporter from a Dutch TV program, and he went to Spain and Greece, I believe, where he confronted. Uh, this was about uh, fema female uh, child pornography, uh, child abusers and stuff, uh, because he made a documentary on, on that topic. And uh, his uh, colleague, she pretended to be uh, uh, also part of this network to this person that they were investigating. And you could see that, I mean, the woman gave tips, uh, the, the suspect gave all sorts of tips of how to avoid detection and how to counter uh, forensics uh, for, from the police, how to encrypt your files. And, and this shows very clearly that within these networks, they are learning how to defend themselves from, uh, uh, from law enforcement and uh, forensics. And you, uh, we hope that uh, at least some of you all here will become uh, forensics, uh, digital forensics investigators, uh, maybe even for uh, for the legal, for the law enforcement. Uh, this is more and more challenging because it's uh, the tools to do this, to hide your stuff, and to, uh, uh, are, are more and more widespread. They're easier to obtain. And they're also better and better. Uh, a good example is this uh, the Robert M case that we had here in Amsterdam, who encrypted his uh, files with uh, TrueCrypt, and the uh, police was uh, not able to decrypt that easily. I mean, uh, that would have been a real tough uh, job to uh, to decrypt it. And it's only uh, because he gave up his password. Uh, that they were able to get to these files, yeah, so that, that that's already uh, uh, an indicator that it's, it's, it's becoming a problem. In the Netherlands, I believe I'm not a lawyer, but I believe that there is a law now that you are uh, obliged. It's mandatory for you to give up your password if you're under investigation. I see people not, so apparently that I'm not the only one who read that in the news. Uh, of course, <laughs> yeah, if you don't, the penalty is going to, to, to imprison, imprisonment and uh, if the passport is hiding an, a prison term for, I don't know, 30 years and uh, the, the penalty for not giving up your pass, password is, what, five years? I don't know, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a law, but I don't know if it has any teeth. To uh, uh, to be uh, how do you say that to be effective? Okay, obviously not every computer forensic investigation includes all the EDRM steps. EDRM is a model for uh, uh, data uh, discovery, uh, electronic <coughs> discovery, and this is a complete model for uh, with a lot of different steps to, of how to do this. But of course, you don't need to do all the steps in every investigation. It depends on the investigation and the situation. And of course, not all forms of data are interested, also depending on the case. For a small case, you know, the effort needs to be uh, uh, proportional to what you can gain. <coughs> Sometimes they don't even start an investigation because it's not worth the effort. A problem, especially with uh, digital forensics, is that all, even in the Netherlands, which is, uh, well, I don't know, I don't know if we have uh, a lot of laws here concerning uh, digital uh, security and uh, uh, digital protection, but uh, in many countries there are very few laws that uh, relate to digital uh, rights. and. Uh, also in the Netherlands, we don't have a lot of digital rights 
and people, especially also the police, doesn't really seem to care about your digital rights too much. So, uh, uh, yeah, if there's not going to be a penalty, <laughs> if the judge isn't going to sentence someone to a prison sentence or a huge uh, fine, then what is the uh, what is the need for an investigation? I mean, what are you going to, going to gain? But there are more and more laws. Okay, well, as we can see, there's more and more computer devices. Here you see a fridge that says, uh, we own your fridge, elite snackers. Uh, <laughs> yes, but that's the whole idea of the IP6, IPv6 uh, introduction, and that more and more devices are getting IP connection connectivity, and we can access them, and smart devices, and my fridge knows exactly when, my, when I'm out of milk and it already tells me oh, you should bring milk. When I'm, in the, when I'm in Albert Heijn, my phone knows that I'm in Albert Heijn and it contacts, contacts my fridge. <laughs> Anything missing? And the fridge says, ooh, the milk is a bit low. Beep, beep. Get milk. Yeah. And maybe Albert Heijn will sponsor that and say, ah, for you, just for you, only for you today, two bottles of milk for the price of one. Just for you, but you have to pick them up now. I mean now. Otherwise, yeah, too late. <laughs> Next time, get them quicker. Um, this is the the future. <coughs> Some people see. I don't know if this is going to happen, but this is the future that people see. Truth is that more and more devices do have internet con connectivity. I uh, I bought a, recently bought a TV, and it has internet connectivity. You can plug it in. Doesn't do anything, but you can plug it in. <laughs> Um, you can hook it up to your wireless internet and then it updates my TV. That's all it does. Uh, so, and, uh, but there's more and more smart TVs now with uh, browsers and Netflix <coughs> inside. and uh, it's, it's, We are getting there. So it's happening. That's more data and more devices. And this is a massive problem for law and order. Because we need to know about the, these devices, how to contain them, how to collect it, how to preserve the data, where's the data stored, how is it stored. It's, uh, uh, it's the reason that there's a lot of uh, a co a specialist companies who are specialized in one specific type of forensics. In the Netherlands, we have uh, the NFI, uh, the Netherlands Forensics Institute, the Dutch Forensics Institute, Fox IT, uh, one of the largest in the Netherlands. Well, also in the world, a very famous player. Whenever <coughs> something happens concerning the government, Fox IT is then in there. Also with uh, banks, if banks get hacked, which they are all the time, as we will hear, uh, March 5th, I spoke with uh, uh, the security officer there at the ING, ING Bank, large bank, and he is going to give you a fantastic presentation. Pros, and he's going to tell you a lot about uh, all the hacking stuff that's going on uh, at, at ING, and with it, I mean uh, the hacking attempts that others try on the bank. It's not that the bank has a huge hacking department that tries to hack uh, whoever or whatever. And Fox IT is a is a, is a very uh, uh, is, is someone who's, who's very well known at ING as well. Uh, they sell a lot of projects products to IG and they do a lot of uh, research for IG. ITSEC is a, is a company that's uh, uh, specialized in IT security. So this is this is a growing market. So for those who are not going to be a forensics inspector for the law enforcement, maybe join one of these firms. They're always looking for good people. You can, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good market now to find a job in this area. Um, Computer security auditing, this is extremely important. And uh, with our new program, we are uh, trying to uh, uh, make this even more prominent in the new classes that we are uh, creating. Because uh, if an incident happens, you want to know what happened. It's, it's like the uh, the black box, which are orange, of course, but the black box in, a, in an airplane, if, uh, if an airplane crashes, they're always looking for the black boxes. 
where are the black boxes? Where are the oh, yes, we found the black boxes and they're all aesthetic yes, and the black. Now everything is fine. Uh, we have the black box, now it's everything. Why? Because they can trace back what led to the incident. And it's the same thing for uh, computer forensics. If you get hacked, I mean the hack itself, yeah, I mean it happened. I mean what, what's far more interesting is why it happened and how it happened, eh? and what caused it to happen, and how, how can I prevent it from it happening again? And uh, how can I predict what, uh, what the cause? And like with, uh, with airplanes, the, uh, the most obvious thing is usually not the thing that, that caused it. That was the, the initial thing that caused it. I mean, if a wind breaks off, uh, you see it lying next to you, you say, oh, the wind broke off. Well, of course it fell down without the wind. I'm not a, a, an engineer, an airplane engineer. But even now, I know that if the wind breaks off, I think it's, it's doomed. I don't know, I've never seen an airplane with one wing. And, you know, well, I have it, but then there's still one wing in the middle. Of the big, uh, <laughs> so uh, it will go down. So, uh, uh, but, but it could be that the wind broke off because uh, maybe it was flying too fast or something. I mean, and, the, and then the flying too fast was the cause, not the fact that the wing broke, the wing broke up <coughs> because it was flying too fast. I don't know. And this could be, uh, the, the, the cause could be much earlier in the chain of all the uh, events that happened that led to the final, uh, the final outcome or the final Dutch uh, Hoge. The, the climax, that's what happens. Um, and so this is this is the same with uh, computer security and computer forensics. You want to uh, uh, to create a log, or you want to audit everything, so that you know as many things as possible what happened. Of course, in a in a computer, logging takes performance and time and storage. Yeah, I mean. It, you, you could collect so many things that it's practically impossible to collect everything that you want because you just get too much data and uh, too much data is, yeah, is again no data because you don't know where to start and where to look. So uh, there has to be some sort of balance. With, uh, with the latest airplanes you see now that the, there's so much data that they collect <coughs> that they don't even store it on the airplane itself but they uh, they can send it over the air, huh? some real-time uh, data, which is very scary because, uh, yeah, with all the hacking going on, I'm not so sure that it's 100% safe. <laughs> that they cannot uh, interfere with the, uh, with the online systems on board, but uh, yet uh, they use it. I, uh, my colleague told me that the latest, uh, I think it was the 777 Dreamliner or something, uh, every flight is a few terabytes of data. On the, because they collect so much data, I mean it's fully digital, and they want to know every sensor, every, on the whole flight. You now have camera images, mm -hmm. there's cameras in the tail, so the pilot can see the airplane from the tail, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, to see if anything is smoking or falling off. Uh, oh, good. Well, how do we do this? In, uh, in com with computers, in Linux and Unix, you can use uh, syslog uh, uh, with these uh, tools. Syslog uh, next generation is a nice one. It has uh, security and it can uh, it, it logs over the network which is crucial. Uh, you, you don't want to have your logging local because the problem is, let's say your computer is being hacked in this case, that if they hack it, they, will, they can alter your log files. So local logging, say with the airplane, if it goes down, you have to hope that the black box survives and that you can find it. But if you can't find it and or uh, it's lost in that it's broken and damaged beyond repair. Then you lose all. You have nothing. And today, with today's technology, it's easy or easy. It's easier 
to send all this information over the network to a safe storage somewhere else. So remote logging is crucial, especially if you want to keep your uh, network <coughs> safe. Uh, against hacking and stuff like that. Microsoft Event Viewer, I think we all know it. The Event Viewer, uh, it's the same thing as syslog on their uh, Linux and the Unix. It just says this service started, this server stopped while all your blog, uh, all your events are stored there. Uh, Java, but not only Java, also C, Python, you name it. Uh, there's a log 4J, originally uh, for Java, but now ported to a lot of different languages. It's a logging framework that you can use for your application to do all sorts of logging. Of course, there's now all sorts of uh, process and counting, uh, accounting. So there's there's a lot of information logged about processes, who started it, when is it, when did it start, and so on and so on. Connections that were made, very important. And like it says on this slide, a proper auditing setup is crucial to doing any form of forensics. Uh, of course. Um, not only on your uh, on your live system that you that you build, also in the systems that you use to do your forensics, and uh, it's very important to uh, to have everything uh, traceable, to make sure that uh, you can you can go back to see what happened if anything went wrong. If you're doing some forensics and something unexpected happens. <gasps> then uh, uh, you could uh, you could lose your system, same thing, you could lose your data. So, same thing. And also there, remote logging is important because if your forensic, while you're doing forensics, your system is compromised by whatever you're uh, investigating, uh, again, they can do the same thing. They can uh, damage your, uh, your or yeah, alter your log files and change everything. A very important key term is an uh, order of volatility. Volatility. Um, this is how long data will be there. How long you have to collect it. As we said collection and preservation is important. Well, what's my time frame for collection? Uh, the CPU gone. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 almost instant. There are possibilities for uh, getting the data out of the CPU. If I uh, stop the system clock, the CPU stops. I mean, it doesn't change anymore. But the, the problem is when I stop the system clock, it, the whole system is frozen. So it's, uh, uh, and how do I get to the CPU? How do I get in there? Big problem. But there are, there might be ways to get in there, but uh, the CPU is very volatile. Uh, this changes all the time. Continuous. Then, random access memory, your RAM memory, same thing, changes rapidly, but not so much. I mean, there's uh, uh, a lot of research on this, where they uh, uh, have, a, have a system, a typical system running, and checking what parts of the RAM are actually changing. And you see that a lot of the RAM stays intact, but it does change. Not all of it, but some parts are changing and more parts are changing over time. So it, it, it takes a little bit <coughs> more time. Really, the CPU, this, I mean the CPU is, is almost instant. It, the contents of the CPU change all the time. There's no way to prevent it that it just changes. Because it's basically the CPU is a tiny bit of memory, but it's so tiny that it's very volatile. The RAM is huge. Uh, if I have, uh, in this computer, I have 8 gigabyte of RAM. Well, I, it's not changing the full 8 gigabyte every second. I mean, that's not happening. Most of the RAM stays uh, intact and takes a lot of time uh, to change. It does change, but it takes a lot longer. Network information, uh, traffic and connection status. Again, this is... Uh, a little 
little less volatile than uh, RAM because there's a lot of buffering going on and delays and so this, this definitely takes a little bit more time. Some data can be very volatile on the network traffic but a lot is, uh, for example, connections. Connections are made and it takes some time for them to disconnect or for all the connections to get, for, for the whole network to forget. Uh, I saw some uh, very interesting uh, research at the NFI where they discovered that if you, these devices have, uh, have Wi-Fi, uh, like all your, I mean, most devices now. These cameras have Wi-Fi, it's unbelievable. Everything has Wi-Fi nowadays. So, um, most of these Wi-Fi devices keep shouting uh, that they're looking for networks all the time. I mean, if you do some, uh, uh, some sniffing <coughs> on the network, if I'm walking in the street and my Wi-Fi is on, it's constantly shouting, Hey, I'm looking for this network. Is this network in the air? Hello, hey, continuously. It keeps shouting. All these devices, continuously. Hey! Well, and there is these routers, these uh, Wi-Fi routers, and, they, and they, they hear these things. Well, because they're, well, hey, are you missing this network? And they, they, they store that information that someone was shouting for that network. And uh, they look it up, and they're like, nah, nah. And, uh, but they store it, because it's stored in their RAM, because they, 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 have, they need to retrieve the information from the network, from the wireless connection, uh, so that they can start processing. And they, pro they, they put it in RAM, and it's there. But these boxes are not switched off at night. I mean, they are always on. So they discovered that if, for example, there's a robbery, which happens 1,600 times a year, I saw it today in the news, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, if there is a robbery, and for example, the, the bank or whatever has a, has a, has a router, so a, a Wi-Fi access point, they could, they usually don't, because uh, again, who cares, but uh, they could open up the box and have a look inside in the box and see what networks uh, did the router look up. And these are the typically the home networks of the person that, is, uh, that the device is on, because that's the first network that he will that the device will shout for. Uh, if my homework is, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, fastest network ever. No, no, no. You need to, you don't want your neighbors to connect. Huh? Uh, always disconnected. I don't know, something like that. Uh, always disconnected. Then this this phone will always disconnected. And of course, thanks to Google, uh, Google knows a lot of our home uh, identifiers huh? because they. I don't believe that they delete that information. I don't believe that for no. But because the, the Google Maps cars, they're driving all over the world, and they also had these Wi-Fi uh, uh, discovery uh, points on their cars. Huh? So they were listening to all the networks that were there and put them on the map and. Uh, so yes, there are there are ways to find out uh, where what networks are, and uh, and nowadays if you have uh, we have the guys from the KPN here, if you buy a, a KPN connection, they pre-install it with an identifier which is reasonably uh, unique, so which is traceable. Again, as with all forensics, we only put in the effort uh, that is proportional to whatever gain we expect to get. And if it's, uh, if it's a small robbery and there's only a few hundred euros stolen, I mean, it's, it's, that's reality. They're not gonna put in a lot of effort. But if it's a big case, if, uh, if someone was killed or something, then the whole, it's a whole different uh, ballpark. And uh, they will put in a lot more effort to find out who did it. And there's more and more ways to uh, find out, and it's just more. It, is, it, it gets easier and easier to trace you. Um, processes, running operating system processes and programs and processes. Yeah, of course we can. If you do, uh, if, you, if you open your process monitor on your operating system, you can see all your processes running. Ah, uh, that, that's volatile, but not so volatile. I mean, now all the same processes are running, 
And typically the processes that I want to, to see, they keep running. Because uh, as a forensics investigator, uh, uh, what would be, uh, if I'm looking for processes, if I'm looking, apparently we're looking for processes. If I would be looking for processes, <coughs> why would I look for what, pro what purpose would it be that I want to see what pro process is running? What do I want to see? <coughs> Malicious process. Malicious process, yeah. I, for example, yeah, that's one class. <coughs> and uh, uh, what... Uh, uh, what kind of malicious process? Backdoors. Backdoors, very important. Yeah. And do you think that they are very volatile? Or with other words, do you think that they disappear quickly from the process list? Depending on the intelligence of the group, you can say they might uh, go away fast. They might go away fast. But yeah. I think that if it's... Uh, <laughs> you are thinking ahead. <laughs> Let's say... There's no rootkit installed, and so it, it has no ways of hiding itself. So let's it's 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 say it's not hidden. Uh, do you think the process will be killed? That it, that it's gone? No. And why not? Because because he wants to get and gain control and keep control. Exactly. I mean, this is the kind of process that needs to be running and keep running because when it's not running, I have no backdoor. And so. Uh, this is a perfect example of the kind of process that I might be looking for, but it's also a very good example that exactly that kind of process that I'm looking for is not that volatile. Thank God. Uh, but there's another. Maybe you can think of another type of process that I'm very interested in before I switch it off the computer. Because once I switch it off, ah. Does anyone know? Does anyone have an idea? <coughs> if I, let's say I'm, I'm the bad let's say I'm the owner of the device and I have some data that I don't want anyone to see, to get. What might I do to prevent, from, to prevent them from getting access to my data? What's the most obvious thing to do? And my virus. I end up yeah, but that's, that's I have a password, but encryption. there are encryption. Yeah, someone said encryption. I will encrypt it. But uh, yay. So I I have the I have encrypted, but let's say I encrypt all my files. Which is possible on the Mac, it's possible to encrypt all my files, I can do that. But it's very inconvenient because if I want to open it, I need to decrypt it. Uh, are there tools? to make this by my life more uh, nice, not so difficult. If I if I encrypt my files, is there a tool, can you think of tools that could automate this maybe? Keychains. Keychain, oh yeah, but that keychain is a, a keychain is a fantastic example, but keychain is a different category uh, than I was looking for. Uh, I'm looking for uh, things like a TrueCrypt, for example, which is a tool. I don't know if that means. TrueCrypt is a very good tool. If you want to hide your data, <coughs> TrueCrypt is definitely something you might want to look at because it's uh, pretty secure. Um, I say pretty secure because mm, I have my suspicions, but it's uh, pretty secure. And if my computer is switched off and I boot it, I need to enter my password, otherwise I, I won't be able to see the, the data. But as long as my computer is running, yeah, I can probably still access my data. Even if I cannot access my data because I need a password to get to it, probably if I look closely in the computer, there, there might still be traces in there. Uh, of how to unlock it. Uh, there might be keys hidden somewhere in there, somewhere. There's a, there's a different uh, presentation on memory forensics, and that, this is where we will look deeper into that, in how to get that kind of information. If my data is, is there, I want to keep my computer running, 
because as long as my computer is running, I have a better chance of finding things like, for example, keychains. If you have a Macintosh, at this moment, my keychain is open. When I shut off my computer, the keychain is closed. And the keychain is, is uh, encrypted. Uh, it's, it's, it's all my passwords and logins on websites encrypted. Now, if I get this computer right now, I can, I can find them. I can get to that information. I can find all my logins to all the websites that I am registered to, where I have automatic login, which is very dangerous. I mean, if you have a, I am registered to a lot of websites, and at this moment, I'm very vulnerable to, uh, for you to get that information. Oh, I feel vulnerable. Huh? Um, this content's also volatile because as it is running, things are changing on the disk. But oh, again, less volatile. It doesn't go as quick as all the others. Flash memory, USB, memory cards. Again, next step, less and less volatile. And CD, DVDs. Yeah. Uh, I have found out recently that they are in fact volatile because uh, I have old CDs that. Bye bye. Uh, there's no information on it that I wanted, but uh, yes, they uh, they do uh, degrade in quality, uh, and I cannot I cannot read the data. War, write once, read many. Uh, for example, the, the DVDs, the CDs, and the If you look at storage devices, typically the device is divided into partitions, and the partition has some sort of uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of, of management structure on there uh, to uh, to find the data and to organize the data that is stored on the device. The device is usually <coughs> some form of block-oriented storage, byte storage. Uh, if you look at uh, at disks. Uh, the, the, the SD card, uh, USB stick, whatever, they're typically oriented on, uh, on 512 byte blocks of, uh, of data. And uh, it could be a lot. Uh, with the modern disks, we have 4 terabyte. Six terabyte. I don't know. What's the largest disk at the moment that you can go people can buy for four? Yeah. I recently bought a three terabyte. <coughs> which is, uh, wow. Three terabyte. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, but now four terabyte is it's <coughs> more and more. It's gone a long way, huh? Sorry? It's gone a long way, huh? Yeah. It's it's sixteen that, MB. Sixteen. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I found. Uh, I was looking for SD cards because uh, of the camera. I was looking for an SD card, and I bought an SD card of 128 gigabyte. Uh, it's, it's HD, so I mean, uh, what is that? Five minutes of video. Uh, but uh, uh, I was looking. Do I, don't I? I thought I had one. And I was looking in my in my whatever on my shelves. Where can I find it? And ta-da! I found it, and I, I was I was happy. I, was, ah, I have one. I don't have to buy it. And I looked on it, and it said 64, and I'm. Yes, 64 MB. megabyte. <laughs> 64 <laughs> megabyte. <laughs> and it's, it's not that old. It's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. It goes so quick. And this is a problem. This is a big challenge. Also for uh, the field of forensics, that we have <coughs> so much data. Um, how do we uh, how do we deal with it? And a very interesting field of forensics and all this uh, data. But it's more on data mining is a visualization and you see that it's, it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger because uh, if we have so much data I mean presenting it in a chart or whatever it's not going to tell us anything anymore. new way to uh, present the presentation well the device can be so huge that managing all that data in itself becomes too complex so what I'll do is I break up the device in several partitions to make the device more manageable. That's the whole idea of partitioning. 
and uh, then put some sort of, of, of structure on there so that I'm able to find the data that's on there and organize the data. And we do that typically with uh, file names and, uh, and some sort, sort of, some form of inodes or whatever, some sort of chaining of the data so that I know this is the file name, uh, info.txt or whatever. That's the file name and the <coughs> actual data is then on blocks of 512 bytes and they are all linked in some form. That's how it works. We will see in more detail uh, uh, how this works. What is this called? This, 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 this organization structure, how do we call that? A file system. A file system. Can you give some examples? NTFS. NTFS, very good. <coughs> AXT. AXT, very good. FAT. FAT, very good. Wow, well, mm. FAT is also one, but it's, it's a good answer. But uh, it's not the one. Well, it is one that we use. Uh, why would we use FAT? Why is FAT a very nice one? To it is a. It is simple. It's simple, yeah. And, and simple is sometimes very good. So uh, FAT is very popular. No, I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to talk you down or anything. Else. It's just that FAT has a bit of a negative uh, uh, air around it because, ah, FAT, FAT, ah, it's Microsoft. No, no. But uh, uh, it is a very popular file system and it's still used on uh, most embedded devices like this, these cameras all use FAT. And the, re the main reason why they use it is, is simple. Huh? Why would you need a more complex uh, file system? What's the advantage of, for, for example, NTFS and uh, EXT? Why do we have others than FAT? Bigger Large files. Sizes. The, wait, here. Larger sizes. Lar larger sizes. Larger sizes. Larger sizes. Yeah. Faster. Don't know about that. And I don't know, I mean, larger files, yeah, sometimes, well, the, the, the latest FAT is also capable of doing quite a lot. Uh, Ability to encrypt. Uh, yeah, encryption, very important nowadays, um, which is easier with uh, the other newer file systems. Very good. Um, for us, as a forensic, from the forensics point of view, FAT is fantastic because it's very simple. It's, it's great. And the others are more, can be more challenging for a lot of reasons. So, in that case, your answer would be fantastic. Yay! Um, where do we find information that we want to get? Static forensic. Static forensics means that it's the system is in a in a steady <coughs> state. It's not changing. So, for example, we have uh, extracted a hard disk from a device. It's out there. Well, it's not changing anymore. I mean, it's if I have it in my hand, it's not changing very fast. At least it will take a very long time. Over time, it will uh, deteriorate, but it will change very much. So, and I can make a copy of it, and now I can statically look at the static data, or I can look at the static data, and, uh, and, and take my time. Where do we find that? Hard disk, USB key, mobile phone. Hashing is crucial. What is hashing? Never heard of hashing. Who can tell me what's hashing? Yes. Uh, hashing is a way to um, make sure that the file system, or in this case the image, has not been altered, has not been tampered with. And how does it work? Well, I'm not, not sure how it exactly works, but it's a way to uh, calculate uh, some sort of uh, number. Yes, uh, uh, he says it, it calculates a number, and by doing so, uh, you can make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. And that's exactly correct. Uh, hashing is a mathematical uh, trick. And it uh, takes the data, it does a very quick calculation already, and it comes up with a magic number. Ta -da! And it's, uh, the hashing function usually works only one way. So, uh, if we have the number, it's, it's very impractical to get back the original data. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult process to find. 
And it's not even guaranteed that this one number will lead to only one set of data. It could be that two sets of data lead to exactly the same number. But this is highly improbable. That's the whole trick. The, the reason we use hashing is because it's fast. Right? We want to do this, we do want to do something fast. And it's very fast, but it's one way. So I have my data, I do my hashing function over it, I have the data, and at the other end, I can I can data and I can give that hashing uh, code, and it's at the other end I can do the same trick and see if I get the same number, and if I get the same number, it has to be the same data. I mean that's the, that's the whole idea of uh, of hashing. Um, the idea is that you that you that it's very improbable that you, if you have, that it's very improbable that if you do the, the hashing over two different sets of data that you get the same hashing number. Uh, but like I said before, it's improbable. It could happen. If this is known to happen, and maybe even uh, it's so easy then I can create different sets of data which will create the same number. The hashing function is, is, is not reliable. And this happened with uh, MD5, MD5, which was a, a hashing function that was used before. Hashing is used a lot for, example, for uh, authentication, for logon, to check if your logon is right. Because then I don't have to give my password. I don't have to send my password over the network. I can take my username, I can take my password, I can do the hashing, I get this hash number, and I can send it over the line, and at the other side, I can just do the same trick. If I, let's say I know the password, I can do the same trick with the same password, and I can check yes. And uh, it's very difficult uh, to extract the password out of this uh, chain, or even just do the password. So, uh, but with MD5, if the same, uh, if there are different passwords that generate the same number, then, then I can log on with. The, I don't even need to know the original password. And this happened with uh, security that was based on uh, MD5. Uh, there were known passwords that would generate a certain hash, and then if you knew the hash, you could say, "Oh, uh, let's pick this password." Bam, and we would uh, log on. Uh, also for forensics. It, it's a very good way to uh, uh, to ensure that the data has not been tampered. <laughs> if we have a file, we create the hash function, the hash hash code, and we, we store it. Ten years later, we can do the same trick and we can prove: see, the data has not changed. This is the data that was collected at that moment, and this is why uh, uh, Arnim started with pres preservation first, because in, in his reasoning. He says you need to start this hashing process as as soon as possible. As soon as you're able to pr to do the hashing, do it. Because once you have that, you have proof that whatever you do after that, the data has not been altered, has not been changed. Also, not in the collection process. Um, we have a, a secure hashing algorithm, uh, SHA1, uh, two, uh, 256, two, uh, three. <laughs> at, uh, at the moment, we uh, typically use uh, one of these. Uh, we are moving to more and more advanced hashing methods as we uh, as we get as we get further uh, in time, because computers get more and more powerful, and it gets more and more easier to break these hashes by, for example, brute force or dictionary attacks or rainbow attacks. What is a brute force attack? Just keep trying. Keep trying, yeah. And if my computer is very powerful, mm -hmm. like the new one from the NSA, huh? they just bought a new supercomputer, it's very powerful, and uh, they could use it for brute forcing. They just try everything. And uh, this one, what's this? <coughs> a dictionary attack. But what is a dictionary? Never heard of it. A list of words. 
<laughs> book of words. But how how would I be able to use a book of words to uh, with in this context? <coughs> a list. With other words, so you, you try every word on the list. <coughs> so yeah, but I still not convinced. How would I be able to? So I have. Because some people use common words as a password. Okay. So you say common words as a password. The whole idea of a dictionary attack is that I make a dictionary of, all, of as many words as I can uh, with the hash. So I can do just a lookup. I have a hash and I don't calculate. I, I don't try to brute force this back into the, to, into the original data. But I can just look up the hash. And I can look up in a dictionary, oh, that hash, that was that data. Uh, this works very well, as you said, for well-known passwords. What you uh, see is that uh, many, 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 many sites are hacked, and they collect hundreds of thousands of passwords. For, for example, you recently had the uh, Twitter hack, for example, right? and uh, what, what Sony is hacked, Twitter is hacked, uh, and they have all these passwords of all these accounts. And they create dictionaries of these. Because you know two things. Apparently, these are the passwords that are typically used. So it's a very good way to create dictionaries from. And it's very likely that if someone used that password in Twitter or at Sony, that they have used it somewhere else again. So, and they put these, uh, these dictionaries and these passwords and these dictionaries. They uh, share them on uh, Pastebin, huh? that's where they share these things. <laughs> and uh, so that's also where you can get your, uh, your dictionaries and your password lists. And you can use them uh, to your advantage. As a forensic investigator, you can use them to... Uh, to uh, of, of course, we are now talking about uh, reversing uh, hashes. And you would uh, do that at a different stage in your forensics process. And this is, this is where you want to make sure that your data has not been tampered with. Uh, but you will also encounter hashes in password files. There's a, there's a thing here. I did mention it's not on the slide, but uh, uh, also related to this are the rainbow tables. What is a rainbow table? Yeah? Uh, hash the words. Hashed words, yeah. 25 words hashed, so you can just search the table or... Uh, yeah. yeah, the rainbow table is, uh, is, is very close to the dictionary attack, but the rainbow table is, uh, is only part of the process. So if I, if I know this has to do with the, with the, the mathematical tricks that are happening here, and uh, I can already do part of the calculation. So to break the hash, I need to do this, much, this many calculations, for example, right, in, a, in a specific case. But what I can do is I can already do some beginning <coughs> and figure out if I can match, if I can match uh, in, in reversing the, the process, if I, if I can identify which uh, uh, part of the calculation is common for a group of uh, hashes, if I can identify it, I can create rainbow tables. And typically this can be done by, with, uh, by, uh, when this, these kind of uh, calculations are concerned. So that means I have rainbow tables, I have uh, parts of the calculation ready, already done, and I can quickly identify, oh, this is uh, that group <coughs> of uh, hashes, boom, look it up, and start further in the brute force calculation. So with a rainbow table, I uh, still might need to do some brute forcing, but uh, uh, I've already done a lot of the work. Uh, the, the work. And Rainbow tables are typically used when uh, the dictionary would become too large. Because of course I can create an infinite dictionary and I would be able to <coughs> look up everything. If you 
comes to logic, <coughs> make create rainbow tables, which takes less time, uh, less uh, storage, and so on. Um, initial analysis is commonly done with forensic software. You see some names here: FTK, NKs, Backtrack, XRY, and so on. Uh, these are all tools that we could use. But of course, uh, in the end, the last part is always uh, uh, specific. Uh, the, all these tools are mainly uh, collection and preservation. That's mainly, I, I see there are real live investigators and, uh, am I right or do yes. I say? Yes. Uh, okay. There, there, there is more, yes. And, there's, and there's, there's not one which is the best. No, no that's a very good remark here uh, from, the, from the field. Uh, there's not one that, that stands out as, wow, that's the one. No, the problem with uh, forensics is that you have uh, different devices. The situation is always uh, always different. So uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And in some cases, this one is a good one, or sometimes sometimes this is a good one. It's uh, sometimes this is a good. But there's not one perfect tool which will do all the work for you. Uh, if there was, they would be make they would be making a lot of money, but there isn't. Uh, and they, like I said, they mainly do a collection and uh, preservation. And then the real work uh, starts. Uh, static forensics, we see here uh, a hard drive. When you take a hard drive, it's very important that you, uh, and we will get a presentation from the field, uh, the, the IRS uh, guys, the criminal uh, uh, investigations uh, branch, of the uh, of the IRS, and in the Netherlands, if you uh, owe more than uh, seventy thousand euros to the state, these guys will come hunt you down. And uh, uh, they are basically the same as the police, and it, it all depends on uh, on uh, how much you owe to the state. If you owe more than seventy seventy thousand euros or more, then uh, the investigation is done by the IRS. That's, that's simple, and uh, um, and they and they are very good examples of what they encounter. Bless you. Here we see a hard drive. This is a little device that does more than just connecting the drive <coughs> to your USB or whatever, so that you can read it. Because I think a lot of you have these little devices. I I love them uh, because I have a lot of these old hard drives, or old systems that I threw away. But I still kept the hard drive for whatever reason, because you want to get your old data. Oh, because that was so important. Um, and you hook it up like this, and you plug it into your USB, and then you can read it, and ah, uh, you have your five megabyte of data back. <laughs> uh, but this this is a similar device, but it has a, a little bit extra, and it's on the slide. What do you think is the uh, property? A, a what? Write blocker. Write blocker, yeah. Nice. What is a write blocker? You can. Uh, makes your files read only. Yeah, and what, not, even only not, 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 your, not even your file, but the whole disk becomes real. Uh, th th there are commands sent over the line. Uh, this is just commands to the disk. The disk in itself is a computer. And uh, it, it has commands like uh, uh, read this block, write this block, uh, cache. There's all sorts of, are you functioning? There's all sorts of uh, commands that you can give. And all the right commands can be blocked by this device. So that you make sure that whatever's on the disk is not altered, it's not tampered. If you hook up uh, a drive from a system that you want to do forensics on, always do that through a right blocker to make sure that it won't be altered. Uh, memory cards, yeah, well, these are pretty, uh, uh, how do you say it, pretty obvious uh, things not to do. Switch on the mobile, browse through photos on the camera, playback movies on a DV cam. Uh, these devices are, are uh, known to alter the, the devices that are in there, right, log files or access or whatever so don't do that uh, getting the data from these uh, chips is very difficult as we might see uh, a little bit later 
let's see. Um, acquisition of the disk image can be done with a DD, a little tool under Linux and Unix. Fantastic tool. You use it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great tool. <huh? laughs> Even a specialized version of it. You have a specialized version of it? DCF LDD. How, how do you call it? DCF LDD. DCF LDD. It's especially made for forensics and um, it has an advantage that if you uh, give some parameter options, that it doesn't stop when recording an error. Okay, cool. Because otherwise it can stop yeah. and you won't okay. see it. So there is a specific, uh, a special forensics version of the DD. Huh? You said DFCL. DFCL <coughs> DD. DFCL DD. And uh, it has uh, uh, parameters to make sure that it keeps reading even if there are readouts. Uh, which is the, 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 this is just a copy tool. Uh, DD is a standard tool in Linux Unix to uh, copy. And of course, uh, if there is an error, it will stop copying. But this specific version. Uh, is to uh, to keep going. There's also uh, uh, co for commercial tools for for example FTK Imager, but there's plenty. There's plenty of these. Uh, this is a very important thing, which is written here. Not just the file systems, but also the slack play. <laughs> All of a sudden, I have a verbal poly on. Huh? Uh, not just file systems, but also Slack space, uh, unclaimed space, hibernation files, swap files, interpartition gaps. Whoa! Um, why would I take Slack space and unclaimed space? So that's that's in between partitions. Huh? Why would I take it? <coughs> or empty space, which is where there's no files. Why would I take that? Data. It's empty. There still might be data from removed files. Yes, there might still be data from removed files, or let's think a little bit maliciously, hidden files. TrueCrypt can make hidden direct, hidden partitions and hidden files, and it's very good at it. So that when you look at it, it's like, ah, oh, it's empty. Uh, 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 uh. All sorts of stuff there. <laughs> so yes, take hibernation files. Whoa, hibernation files. What are hibernation files? Sleep. Yeah. Mars one. Hibernation file. If I close my laptop, <coughs> it goes to sleep. But what it does, it saves my RAM memory to disk. So. When it wakes up, it reads my RAM memory from disk, puts it in a RAM, bam. It's, it's like a, I don't know, did anyone play with a Amiga or Commodore? Uh, yeah, I see some, some people nodding. Yeah, 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 cool, of course. Yeah, me too. Oh, Amiga, Commodore, Atari. Uh, you had the freeze button. You could, uh, uh, on the Commodore you had a power cartridge or whatever, and you could play a game, and you would, there was a button, freeze, uh, and uh, what it did was uh, stop the system clock, so the whole, si the whole system was then uh, stopped. And then you could uh, save the contents of the RAM uh, on disk or whatever. And so, so th this was a very effective way to copy uh, games. Because the game was all copy protected and whatever, but once it was loaded, you could play it and it was loaded. And then you would freeze the computer and store the RAM on the, on the disk. And then you had a loader, <coughs> and you, you would load the RAM back into the Commodore, and you would play, and you, your game would be going. That's <laughs> fantastic. And this is how you would circumvent the uh, copy protection on a lot of uh, files. It was fantastic. Um, but the hibernation file is very similar to that on your laptop. If you close it, it saves your RAM. And when you open it, it loads the RAM, and it just keeps continue, uh, it continues where it uh, stopped. This file is on the disk. So if I have this file, this is gold for uh, for forensics investigators because I can even do I can I can do static forensics on a live RAM file on a on a file uh, RAM image that is gold. Huh? Uh, Olympic Games. Just 
pieces. <laughs> this is by far uh, the golden model. If you if you if you get the hibernation file, it's uh, <coughs> this is uh, yes the, the holy grail of files that you want to have. Uh, swap files, same thing. Interpartition gaps, because interpartition gaps, there could be a lot of data hidden. Yeah. Uh, well, file systems, we already uh, saw them. Uh, FAT, NTFS, uh, the, the page files that, that you could find. Uh, Linux, all sorts of file systems. Mac OS, all sorts of file systems. Uh, make sure, and this is always a good uh, advice, if you do forensics, get to know your target. Uh, to make sh so make sure that you know exactly what you are doing forensics on. Because you need to know where are the files, what are the things that I'm looking for, and uh, what do I need to preserve. Uh, it's very difficult to be a very good specialist on all platforms. It's very unlikely that you are. I mean, either you know everything about Windows, or you know everything about Linux, or you know everything about Mac. I mean, uh, and this is also why all these uh, commercial uh, 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 um, uh, companies exist uh, with all those issues because it's just too much, it's so much information. <coughs> data and meta carving, what is that? What is data carving? Meta carving? What could it be? Any idea? Analyzing file headers. Analyzing file headers, yeah. Well, it is uh, carving is a, is a specific word for in forensics <coughs> to uh, find files that are not complete or not available. Or not <coughs> hidden is a big word. It could be any form of files that are somehow uh, not in the uh, accounting uh, system that is used, in the file system. So they are not in the file system, but the files are there. So they could be deleted or damaged or whatever. And uh, a lot of things on your system have uh, signatures. For example, an executable. How do I recognize an executable? Is there an easy way to find an executable? A Windows executable, for example? On a, if I have the hard disk with thousands of blocks, is there a simple way, a very quick way to find an executable? Permissions. Permissions. <coughs> all, all files, uh, all executables on the Windows, uh, but in general, all executables and in general, many, many, many files have a so-called magic number, and a magic number is a is a signature, a small signature of only usually two bytes, but it could be a little bit more, but just a few bytes which identify that, the, that, that this data is this type of, uh, is, is this type of file. And the uh, PE file, that's what it's called, the Windows file is a PE file. And if you look, I don't know it by heart, but if you, uh, if you Google uh, PE file, Wikipedia, so you, you, you will surely find the uh, magic number for the PE file. And it's, I believe it's the first two bytes of this uh, file is a specific signature <coughs> to make sure to that is why Windows if you start if you just rename <coughs> anything into dot exit and you double click it it will say ah 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 this is not a Windows file how does it know because it looks at these at these first two bytes for the magic number it's ah 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 it's not the right magic number so it's not a, it's not a valid executable but this is very much to the advantage for us as, as forensics investigators because we can just it's always the first two bytes of a block I don't even need to scan the whole block I only need to look at the first two bytes of a block so I can read the block, check the first two bytes no, nah. read the block, check the first two nah. read the first, nah. and so on, and I only have to do that for the blocks that are not in my uh, in my file system huh? not in my structure, because all the official files I know that the blocks are part of some file, and I know which file. So all the empty blocks and the empty blocks in between uh, 
in, in between partitions. I can scan <coughs> these uh, magic numbers. And that is what the software of uh, data and meta carving, what they do is they look for these signatures and they're all, and it can be done very quick. Boom. And the advantage is if you have the first one, then it's it's usually doable to find the rest of the data as well. Because it's easier if you have the first block of a chain, it's easier to find the others than if you in the middle find a block. And if you're looking, for example, if I look for a, a hidden uh, file and I'm, I'm just scanning the disk and I find data, text, all of a sudden, and it's like uh, the text uh, password or whatever, then I have a block. I, it's easier because usually the link is only to the next blocks. So then from that I will find the next blocks. But still I don't know what blocks are in front of this block. It's, it's very difficult. So data carving and meta carving is, is, is difficult to do. But in, in a sense it's a very simple trick. It's just that it's uh, very likely that, you, that somewhere the chain will be broken because that will be over, has been overwritten or something. So uh, it is the last, uh, it, 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 it is what you do last. Uh, in the end, because it's very unlikely that this data is, uh, is, is part of the, uh, it is very unlikely that that data would be access, accessible, still be accessible by the person of who the system was. I mean, it's probably data that had been deleted or something. But sometimes you want to delete the data. And sometimes it, that is exactly what you want. And then you have to resort to uh, data carving and meta carving. Well, static forensics, here you see uh, a list from the NFI <coughs> on which devices you can do uh, static uh, forensics. Oh, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Huh? Uh, varieties of ROM, APROM, AAPROM, DRAM. Uh, DRAM, SRAM, uh, FERAM, Flash, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, <coughs> at the NFI, they have been known to take chips apart, to uh, physically look at the chips, which is possible. Um, there is a very famous uh, hack of these, uh, these uh, smart cards, uh, here's a bank card, and uh, Bank cards in the EU, they have this little chip on there, and this uh, this chip communicates with the uh, with the ATM to uh, to do the <coughs> transaction and, and so on. Well, uh, this is a very simple chip, but it is still a computer, and it has a it has a hidden key in there, a secret key. Ah, oh, hidden secret. No one knows it. Well, some people do, but very few. I even wonder if anyone actually knows the key. I don't. Um, I have worked at uh, the ABN Emro and we had a, uh, a process for installing uh, computers uh, where the password of the administrative password was unknown, <coughs> but was really known by no one because it was automated. Uh, the, the installation was automated, the password was generated during this process, and it was uh, encrypted, and uh, the encrypted file was stored on a disk, and it went into, uh, into the vault. Uh, so, and it was all sealed and everything, and it was very uh, official. So, and uh, if, if a system got installed, then there would always have to be at least two people. There was a whole process to make sure that no one had the administrative password for any system there, for security reasons. So I, I could imagine that they use a similar process for these cards to make sure that no one actually knows the key. Uh, but that's it stored somewhere in case they really need it. I don't know. Um, we know people from this system, so maybe we can ask them. Because I'm sure it's not a secret if, if it's known or not. Uh, but these cards are also used, this type of cards is also used for uh, uh, pay TV for these uh, set-top boxes like UPC and uh, well, all these TV channels, uh, Sky and whatever. That is a huge market. The, the, the market for these chips is huge. Uh, there's several systems. There's the German yeah, data system. That's not too good. You have uh, uh, the 
Konax, Konax, I think, from Scandinavia. Uh, you have to you have a video crypt from Israel. That's the big one. That's the number one, I think, in the world. You have a Nagra script or something. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of them. In uh, Europe, the largest one was MediaCrypt from France. That was the big one. It was a big com competitor in the market. The, uh, the main market was by uh, VideoCrypt from uh, Israel. And they did uh, the UK and I believe America. <coughs> and in mainland Europe, it was mostly MediaCrypt and AirData. AirData for Germany, but that was not very safe. MediaCrypt was very safe. Could not be hacked. <coughs> and all of a sudden, the key, the hidden key on this card was out there through the Netherlands. Uh, Zandam. A kid in Zandam. <laughs> uh, and the rumors go, the rumors go that the uh, that in Israel they uh, they they, uh, they took the chip out and had a look at the number, at the data. Because Anyone can get the data out of this chip. It's not that difficult. All you need is an, uh, <coughs> an electron microscope. Uh, I don't have one. There's not that many around. I mean, uh, there's, there's obviously a few in the Netherlands, I'm sure, but it's not easy to get there. And uh, I think they would frown upon anyone putting a, a chip like this under the microscope to have a look. Uh, because if you put this chip under the microscope, you can just see the data. You can, just, you can see it. Uh, it takes some time because uh, you can see a lot more things than just the data. You see the whole chip, so you need to have some uh, knowledge of uh, how these chips uh, work, of how the technology works. But if you are uh, willing to put some uh, effort in it with a microscope, you could see the data. So you could uh, you could hack it. And uh, and and. Yeah, like I said, rumors go that the uh, that in Israel they put it under a microscope and leaked this number uh, out uh, to the world. <coughs> and uh, ever since the uh, media uh, uh, guard media guard system is uh, is not as popular anymore, and the uh, the Israeli system is uh, more and more popular. So it's 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 funny to see uh, how these things go. And what is possible? Uh, and you can, if you have the right tools, you can look at the chip and just look at the data. However, it's getting more and more difficult to do this because of uh, the, the, the type of chips that we use. Um, it's not as easy as it used to be. Office system, communication, transport systems, uh, GPS, well, I don't have to go over the whole list. It's obvious that all these devices, look at all the devices. Wow. I got a question. Yes. Why why would your computer networks as you mentioned static forensic? Because the data is not quite static. Uh is it was it this slide or the previous yeah, one? Previous slide. Previous this one. Yeah. Third bullet. The communication system. Data links hubs, <coughs> routers. Yeah, data link hubs, routers, bridges, yeah. Why why is it static? Oh, why is it static? Yeah. Uh, well, you could do static, but this is not that, that it is uh, static. As in making a capture? Uh, Which is static? Well, they have, uh, they, ha they have all sorts of uh, ROM in there, for example, uh, which I could take out. And if I... Uh, uh, especially uh, these devices have, have a lot of uh, APROM and uh, ROM uh, in okay, them. And these, these things are all static. I think this is what they mean with it. Because it, uh, it's not mutually exclusive. It doesn't mean that these devices cannot be used for live forensics. Uh, live forensics is when they're running huh, with all the volatile data going on. Uh, probably it's and and uh, both. Yeah, you would agree with me? Yeah. Uh, I agree. Okay. Well, I have, yeah, well, yeah, otherwise, the answer satisfies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> good. Good. You're free to disagree. Um, well. A proper uh, image is a bit-level copy and contains master boot record, partitioning, file system structures, swap file, <coughs> hibernation file, deleted file, obfuscated data, could be huge and is becoming more and more of a, a problem. What is a master boot record? We didn't mention that. What is a master boot record? <laughs> 
Yeah, the master boot record is the very first block that is read by uh, the device to uh, usually boot the system, start the system. Usually the, the system has some form of uh, firmware in there, software that is activated when uh, the device is started. So I switch on the device. If there was no software, all it would do was light up and get more. I mean, it, it needs software to do actually do something. Well, this software is typically in some form of ROM or APRO or whatever, uh, which is called the BIOS, uh, typically, or firmware, or whatever firmware, and it's, it's starting the device, it's checking, is everything working, and then it goes looking, it goes looking for, uh, for boot devices, and maybe a disk, or, a, or an SD card, or a USB, or whatever. <laughs> And it goes to uh, this. This this uh, uh, this process is is fairly uh, universal. It fairly so they they are looking for in whatever way they're looking for a boot-up device. They find the device, which is a storage device, and uh, they read the first block. And the first block, and again they check it typically for a magic number to to see is this bootable. And if this is bootable. They will start executing the code of that block. And usually that code is not only the code, but also has data about the device itself. How large it is, how many blocks, what kind of blocks, uh, what type of file system, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then it starts. That's, that's typically how it works. Um, in, in Linux, I think we talked about this, in the Linux classes, about how this, uh, this process works. Uh, Let's see. How about data recovery? Yeah, if uh, if I overwrite the data, it's very difficult to uh, to retrieve the data. So what you see now is you have this uh, save delete kind of options and uh, secure delete. Uh, what they do is just write random data over the file that used to be there. And if they write random data over it, it's becoming very difficult to actually read the original data. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just becoming more and more of a challenge. Um, up to the point, well, this is this is very similar to what, or very very uh, uh, related to what I said before. Uh, it's always the effort I need to put in uh, against the uh, the game that I can get from it. And uh, this is becoming, to retrieve that kind of data is becoming such an effort that it's very rarely done. It has to be very important uh, if I want to take that data back. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, there is an example, by the way, the first time this was done, was uh, when an airplane crashed in France and uh, the uh, black box was destroyed, the disk, they couldn't read the, uh, I think it was a tape, but, but a tape and a disk is essentially the same thing. Uh, a disk is just uh, uh, a round tape, so to say, round tapes. It's the same technology. And uh, they couldn't read the tape anymore, and then uh, an investigator said, well, let's put it on a microscope, and we can just see the bits. And they, uh, they put it under a microscope and they took pictures of the uh, very close up image of the tape where you could actually see the zeros and ones. Uh, unbelievable. And they got that, it was a long time ago, so 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, when uh, labor was uh, still cheap, also in France. <laughs> it's becoming cheap again. I see people laughing, but uh, yeah, when it was still cheap. And uh, they, they, they hired a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of people who typed, and then from the pictures they typed in John, one, zero, one, 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 one. And again, it, it, they really wanted to have the data from that uh, flight recorder because they wanted to investigate uh, the accident. Uh, nowadays, that would practically be impossible because, again, the flight data recorders have become much more complex with much more data. So if now it's destroyed, it's so many zeros and ones, not even China has enough people to, uh, to do that. It's uh, just too much. Um, yeah, still holding out. Good. Um, 
we can have a little break. Little break. Wait, well, static frenzy is almost over. But I think the whole presentation is uh, almost over. Uh, yeah, because the live forensics is not that much. Uh, data recovery in practice. Uh, <coughs> data density too high. Oh, we already said it. Recovery sectors. Hard disks are now, uh, they are little computers and they're becoming smarter and smarter. Hard disks have what is called uh, SMART and SMART is a, an acronym, very smart acronym for that it's SMART. Uh, uh, you, can do, you can ask, you can do all sorts of uh, commands, you can give the disk all sorts of commands to uh, do recovery of the data and to avoid data loss. S SMART was introduced to warn you before the disk crashes. So as it is going on, the disk might give read errors and it can tell the operating system, I don't think this disk is going to hold much longer. And uh, you as a user could then use that to change your disk. That was the whole idea. But it has a lot of uh, interesting uh, things that you could do uh, with the computer in the disk to uh, retrieve your data. Zero chop, well this is that the data is, uh, when it's gone, it's really gone, if you override it with random data. <coughs> um, SSDs are a huge challenge. SSDs are, uh, the chips are divided into blocks. We don't know how large the blocks are. These blocks could be Half a byte, uh, half a uh, half a kilobyte, one kilobyte, ten kilobytes, hundred kilobytes. We don't know. That is how the how the design of these chips is, which is different for all these chips. So the SSD chip doesn't have the 512 byte blocks that we typically use on a on a on a device for uh, as we typically use in a file system. So that means that the uh, the SSD has a little <coughs> computer in there that uh, tries to keep track of all the uh, all the fragmentation that's going on because it can only delete cells or delete blocks in the size that it is designed to use so if it has blocks of let's say 100 kilobyte then uh, it can only delete a full 100 kilobyte but as you as with the normal file system you get a lot of fragmentation and some blocks are full, some blocks are half full, some blocks are they have just a few bytes of information so what this uh, SSD is, is, is doing all the time is rearranging all the data and it keeps track of where the data is the SSD has its own file system it's not a file system because it's, it's, it's just a management system of, the, of its blocks but it is like there is a, a, a file system, a unique file system inside the SSD. And this is a huge problem. Because if I open up the chips and I look at the chips, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I mean, I have, this is, it has no resemblance with the original <coughs> file system. And another thing, that's the garbage collection. The garbage collection is that if I delete half of the cell, of SSD, it is not deleted. It cannot be deleted because I cannot delete half a cell. I can only delete a full cell. So if I want to delete half a cell, what I need to do is read the rest that I want to keep, put it somewhere else where I still have a little bit of space left, and then delete the full cell. And so I can reuse it. So and that's garbage collection, which is constantly going on in your SSD. Where leveling is the problem that I can only write a cell so many times. So what it keeps track of is how many writes has been have been done on all the cells. And if one cell is constantly written and read, it says, ooh, this is not good because this cell is going to die sooner than all the others. So what it's going to do is move these cells around a bit so that all cells are, are written at a more or less equal <coughs> pace to protect your SSD. And this is the, the big kicker. The controllers are different for all these SSDs. So this is a big problem. SSD is a real problem. 
Uh, then there are things like uh, RAID. This is a fantastic slide about RAID. <laughs> Standalone, cluster, hot swappable, RAID 0, uh, RAID 0, uh, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 0 plus 1. It's fantastic. Uh, someone had a great day at the office. Huh? Uh, but that's, that's also a problem. If you have RAID, then your data is divided over several disks. And, ah, uh, I had the, I once had the uh, the challenge of uh, of recovering data from a crashed uh, a really crashed uh, RAID system, which was a real challenge. Yeah, a, a RAID system that crashed with more uh, RAID five. If you have two disks crashed, you still have a problem because uh, the data is gone. Then. Uh, it cannot recover from a two disk uh, crash, um, and that's a challenge. Other considerations, encryption, anti-forensics, very important. Um, yeah, so what, what uh, here it says, for example, against static forensics, people can do that uh, whitening, eh? the, uh, what we said, they're just write random data over your deleted files, and this is very effective. This is very effective. Uh, encryption can be very effective, although, uh, I always get suspicious when a government says you sh we recommend that you use this kind of encryption and I go uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. so, uh, recently this happened with uh, A AES which was recommended by the United uh, government, the United States government, and they said, they said, uh, yeah, you should use uh, AES, and immediately triggered my, oh, I thought this is, mm. <laughs> why would they recommend me to use it? And uh, now it turned out, uh, with because of the Snowden files, that they are able to uh, decrypt it. Uh, yeah, big surprise, big whoop. Um, so, uh, in some countries it's even uh, illegal to use uh, encryption, uh, like France. In France, it's, you're not allowed to use encryption. <coughs> there are similar laws in the Netherlands, uh, but more encryption can be uh, decrypted than you think. But don't, I mean, uh, most forensics can be done uh, avoiding the whole encryption at all. If, uh, like I said before, if I use uh, TrueCrypt on this laptop, what I want to do is get in uh, so that I don't even have to hack the encryption. If I, if I can get into the keychain, then I have all the password and the, and the keys that I need. If I can uh, get to the, to the decryption keys, then I can just decrypt it. Then I, then I, then I, then I don't have to brute force it or anything. So I try to make sure that I'm not even bothered by the encryption, uh, because encryption is always a bother, uh, one way or the other. Root kits. What is a root kit? What is a root kit? <coughs> Who can tell me what a root kit is? No one. A, a rootkit is uh, is software. Oh, yeah, it is software um, that is uh, so deep in your system that it can hide uh, itself and other software from view. So, uh, for example, if I uh, if I manage to get under the uh, the, the virus scanner, in, 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 in a hierarchy, the virus scanner is reading the disk uh, to, to see if there's any malware on the disk. If I'm able to get in between the virus scanner and the disk, <laughs> I can tell the virus scanner whatever I want to tell. So uh, the virus scanner will ask, can you read that file for me? It will ask the operating system, can you read that file for me? And, and the malware is in between, the rootkit is in between. So it will hear that, can you read that file for me? It takes, wait a minute, wait a minute. So it tells the operating system, <coughs> I'll do that. And it reads the file, and it says, okay, you can have that, you can have that. Oh, that's me. 
let's hide, let's, keep, let's, let's leave that out. There's no, <laughs> no need for you to, get to, to deal with that. That's all, that's all fine. So it will give you the original file with all the things that the rootkit doesn't want you to see taken out. The same works, for example, process manager, where you're looking for which processors are running on my system. And it will, it will ask the process manager, it will ask the operations, all oh, which processors are running. The rootkit is in between, and it was like, oh, let's wait a minute. This list is a bit long, don't you think? Maybe we should leave a few processes out of this list. Mm, I said, ah, oh, that one, let's do that one. Ah, it's not important. That's, it's, uh, so, this is how rootkit works, and they're very effective. They work fast. If you have been infected by a rootkit, uh, yeah, it's... A good rootkit, it cannot be detected. It's, uh, uh, yeah, they are really difficult to deal with. Uh, data hiding, any of this, uh, the advanced data stream, of the, uh, the ultimate data stream. There is, uh, there's all sorts of uh, hidden, hidden data that you can add to uh, files, for example, in NTFS with the ultimate data stream, uh, or hide your uh, data inside other data. Who hasn't heard of the, the, the Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda I should say, I think, huh? uh, Al-Qaeda uh, way of communication where they would post uh, images on the net, on the internet. So there was a JPEG, uh, JPG, and it, uh, it showed, uh, I don't know, a JPG of a zombie heading, I don't know, uh, some, some it's always the same sort of pictures that you see from Al-Qaeda. Uh, there's never a nice vacation photo with, uh, oh look at us at Disney World. Huh? It's always uh, some form of uh, beheadings. Uh, <coughs> but if you look at a picture, then you just see the picture. But hidden in the picture is, is a message. And that is very difficult to find. It, it's becoming easier to find because they have found out that uh, Al-Qaeda is using this form. So it has become very effective in detecting whether that is in there. Uh, but it's tricky. And, and you have to look really deep, you have to be very smart to uh, find that data. First of all, you need to know where it is. Because if you, if you just look at things, nothing is what it seems to be. I mean, if you look at the file, it seems to be a uh, text, a JPEG. You know, uh, I'm not looking for a JPEG, I'm looking for an executable or something, but it could be hidden in a JPEG. Uh, and that's just one example. Needle in a haystack problem, huh? Uh, tools that you could use. This is uh, FTK, a tool. <coughs> for you, I can really recommend having a look at uh, Kali. Oh, such a nice tool it is. Kali is just uh, uh, Linux, just uh, standard Linux, but it has uh, all sorts of uh, tools installed for uh, cool stuff. It officially pen testing, uh, so, so uh, uh, pen testing is testing security, but a lot of uh, tricks and trades that you need as a forensic investigator are, are breaking through security because the, the thing that you're, the object that you are trying to investigate might be uh, blocked or try, trying to uh, uh, prevent you from getting to the data. Well, the disk is not useful, that this uh, we all said. I think uh, uh, complex solutions, this is, uh, I think there's nothing on the slide that we haven't uh, said before. You're not interested in the disk, you're interested in the data. Okay. And uh, it could be uh, a lot. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's just finish the slides and then we can stop. Uh, because I don't think there's that many uh, left. <laughs> Live forensics is forensics that you do on a running system. Uh, <laughs> Examples, raiding a house, sniffing a network, uh, sniffing a suspect's uh, PDA while he's serving, uh, monitoring chat networks used by criminals. 
<coughs> Again, order of volatility is crucial in life financing because the longer you wait, the more has been uh, changed. Um, Botnets, these are examples that, uh, uh, that you could investigate. Uh, a botnet, criminal chat networks, network connections. Sometimes you just have to do live forensics because there's no way to make it uh, static. Sometimes that's just the way it is because the, 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 the type of, uh, of thing that you are trying to investigate uh, is just something that, cannot, that, that has to be investigated in real time. Like, for example, a botnet. I mean, a botnet is gone once you, uh, uh, if you're not part of it, you cannot watch it. Chat, same thing. With, uh, with chat, we have some very nasty examples uh, of, of chat forensics that have gone horribly wrong. Like the, the, guy, the, the, the little kid here in the Netherlands, in, uh, wasn't it Groningen? He was on a, on a, he was playing an online game, I think a first person shooter or something, and he was a bit frustrated or something, and he said or wrote during this game to his friends with whom he was gaming, ah, tomorrow I'm going to go to school and kill everyone, or something like, shoot everyone to the head, or something like that, uh, while he was playing this game. And uh, one of the automatic scanners of the uh, police went off, oh! Tomorrow there's going to be a school shooting, and this uh, kid was arrested. Yeah, he was arrested. Yeah, yeah you should Google it and read it. Yeah, yeah you remember. Yeah. He's Yeah, but it was strange because he. Uh, I think he did. Well, but even worse, I think he did end up in court. Even it was so weird. It was really. I mean, it was. It was in Costa Rica, right? He was in Costa Rica, something like that. Could be. He was uh, chatting with uh, Costa Rica or something, yeah, something like well, that. I yeah. 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 But it was. I, I, I read it and I thought this is. It was, it was in a game and I'm like, okay, this, this is very weird. So you see that uh, uh, live forensics on a chat channel could could go wrong. Huh? Um, Yeah, it depends on, uh, as you can see, it depends on, uh, live forensics is very complex because there's so many different uh, uh, possibilities of what you need to uh, investigate. And there's, a system can be created in so many ways and you don't always know up front what to expect. So if I, uh, if I, if I raid a house and I get to the computer, and I want to get, for example, the encryption keys and stuff from the computer. Uh, I don't know what to expect. I don't know, if, is there a rootkit installed? Is there, is there any physical barrier? Are there explosives in the device? I think Arnim already meant it, uh, mentioned this uh, last uh, week. You will hear the guys from the, from the field, from the IRS. They have discovered devices that were booby trapped with explosives. So that, that's uh, very tricky. That's, that's yeah, scary. Very scary. Uh, that makes it much more complex. Um, <coughs> RAM can sometimes be examined, but we will look at that, into that in a, in a special, in a uh, separate presentation uh, later on about uh, live forensics. And especially this thing, memory freezing, we will have a look into that. And RAM copying of a firewire. Ooh, unbelievable. Firewire. Firewire is an open gate to your RAM memory. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> we earlier had the, uh, the page file that, uh, that was like a holy grail. Well, the firewire is the next one. Firewire. And the page file. That's so. Uh, uh, Fantastic, fantastic. We will see, we will see. Microsoft has their own computer online forensics evidence extractor. That was a USB stick 
that you could stick into a, a, a Microsoft computer and you can suck it in, and you can suck all the information out of it. Yeah. So, uh, everyone knows that Microsoft uh, could be, uh, e could easily be, uh, uh, the security of Microsoft could easily be circum circumvented. Eh? Um, but yeah, it was that easy. You could just stick in the USB stick, stick, and you could extract all sorts of information from that uh, Windows uh, computer. However, uh, this acronym reads COFFEE, and uh, it was leaked to the world. So someone uh, didn't keep it secret that there was this uh, USB stick, and uh, uh, <coughs> somehow it got into the hands of uh, people who uh, didn't agree with this, and they created uh, DCAF. And DCAF <laughs> is uh, software that you can install, and then if you have DCAF installed under Windows, uh, this won't work. So, uh, uh, commercial solutions, FTK, end case. Uh, live view, best ever booting of an image. If you have a disk image, you can try to boot it with uh, live view, and uh, it will. Uh, it will. It has a. It, it doesn't alter the image itself. So all the writes are stored in a different file. So that's pretty cool. That means your original disk is safe. Your your image is safe. It's not altered. You can make the image read only and still read and write to the image because it will keep it in a separate file. So it's a pretty cool tool. Um, yeah, live forensics might be the only uh, a viable method of investigating, for example, honey, uh, uh, botnets, honeypots, honeynets. Um, botnets, what is a botnet? That's important to mention because maybe not everyone knows what a botnet is. What is a botnet? A lot of zombie computers. It's a lot? A lot of zombie computers. A lot of zombie computers? Infected systems. Infected systems, yes. Well, that's a, that's a very good uh, way of describing it. A botnet is a <coughs> network of hacked computers. And we will uh, go into this uh, into, into more detail uh, later. But a botnet is a, is a network of computers that are hacked. And they are under control of some uh, malicious person. And uh, typically they rent it out to uh, other malicious organizations to do all sorts of uh, bad things like uh, DDoS attacks, DDoS attacks, or uh, extortion, um, gathering uh, private information, banking information, all sorts of things. But this is live. I mean you need to investigate it live because you need to be part of the network to see what's going on, what comments are given and how it is used. Malware, you want to see what the malware is doing. Uh, you want to see malware coming in your system, you want to see what the malware is doing. To see. If you want to investigate the malware, you need to see it in action. Because it, malware is, today's malware is very complex. It, it, is, it changes, it's, uh, it's updated, it gets, most malware nowadays gets its commands live, so it's just it's just like sleeping software. It could be as simple as a as a as a little file server, as a little server that loads a command with some file over the network, loads the file into the RAM and starts the file. And then if you if you examine, if you do static forensics on that malware, all you see is that it, it, it that it can load data into the RAM and that it can start the data. But yeah, what it does, you need to see what it does when it's actually happening. You need to see what is loaded, what is executed, what happens. Uh, because usually what is loaded is first en encrypted and you need decryption keys. So you need to see what's happening. So you need to, to watch it live. Uh, and that's malware analysis. You see on the fly compression, polymorphing, sandboxing. These are all tricks that are used by today's malware. Uh, polymorphing uh, means that the software is constantly changing itself. Uh, it's, it's, it's actively changing. So uh, what it does, how it operates, encryption. Good examples are Duku, Nikda, Zeus, uh, 
Zeus is a very strong botnet at the moment. It's very strong. Uh, uh, the strange thing is these botnets are so good that uh, they cannot uh, they cannot uh, get rid of them. They have arrested tons of people who are uh, uh, responsible for these botnets. But it's like Linux, uh, like open source. There's so many people involved and so many people are infected that uh, and, it, and it keeps evolving and uh, that it's practically impossible to get rid of these botnets. They exist for many years now. Uh, Dooku, that's from the uh, American government, huh? who uh, in uh, fact uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear, what's it called? Nuclear facility, yeah, but it's an enrichment plant. Huh? That's what it is. Uh, it had a, it had a PLC computers, Siemens, German PLC computers, uh, programmable, programmable logic computers, and uh, Duku. Uh, and what was the original name? Stux. Stux. Uh, the the Stux uh, worm. Uh, Stux and Duku. They attack the Iranian uh, plant. Yeah, enrichment plant. And they are very smart, they are very advanced. And uh, Duku and uh, Stuxnet, the advanced part of it is that it's a multi-stage uh, malware. So it attacks, it attacks the, uh, the target, not directly, but via, via a route. So first it, it has three attack, attack layers, huh? three layers of attack. Uh, and that you, you need to see it happen. Otherwise, you don't understand. Um, encryption, artist, the key is still in RAM. Booby traps, such as DCAF, we mentioned it before. Um, yeah, sometimes you uh, want to uh, keep things alive, uh, just to make sure that no one is running away because they, 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 they see that something is going on. That is why they typically raid these networks like child porn networks all at the same time. Because they know that as soon as they, they arrest one person of the group, all the, they are constantly online with each other. <coughs> if they arrest one person, all the others immediately know that something is wrong. And they will start erasing information, uh, flee, things like that. So you want to, to catch them all at the same time. So that's why sometimes you need to <coughs> to keep the systems alive longer. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you are also watching the, the, the ice skating. <laughs> oh, ice skating. Ah, oh, Olympic game. Ah, oh, yes. What's, it's over? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's just started. Uh, ice skating. Huh? Ice skating, okay. Yeah. Uh, but racing or figure skating? What's, uh, what's it? Racing. Racing, okay. We've got 1,500. 1,000. 1,000. Okay, so we might win, huh? Back to friends. Well, back to friends. We're, we're there. <laughs> see, it's summary. So that's the, the last slide. What do we see? <laughs> we have uh, manual versus uh, automatic uh, forensics. Automatic forensics is only the first step. Mainly uh, collection and preservation. The rest is all still manual labor. Static versus live forensics. Static is nice, but static cannot do everything. And so we need to sometimes we need to go live to, to do live forensics. But live forensics is a real challenge. Although sometimes live forensics makes the statics forensics less of a challenge. Because if in my live forensics I can take the encryption keys, then I can use them <coughs> to do static forensics on the on the disk. So uh, both could be very beneficial. Encryption is a real problem for law enforcement in many cases, especially because law enforcement is not the same as the as the military uh, intelligence service. Huh? They they cannot use the same resources, so it's a uh, more and more of a challenge. You may get lucky when the keys are in RAM already set. 
proper encryption tool and tools are essentially still uncrackable. There's a lot of uh, encryption out there that is uh, tough. Um, if you use the right ones, then you can make it really difficult. Whatever you're doing, interpretation is manual labor. The last line on this slide is very important. As an investigator, you should not, uh, you should not uh, uh, draw any conclusions. You don't decide, oh, this is, this is wrong or uh, this has happened. Stick to the facts. You only stick to the facts. You, you try to get data, you, you are objective, and you, you get the data from the disk and you say, well, this is what I found. This is, yeah. There are cases known where forensic investigators have lied to, uh, also in the Netherlands, um, also in the Netherlands, in the, in, the, for, in the law enforcement, because they really want to see the, the perpetrator behind bars, and they, uh, it happens. Uh, of course, they try to do everything to avoid that, but this is really, if you ever, be, if you ever become an investigator, really stick to the facts. But stick to the facts, be clean, be in, uh, integer. Uh, uh, integer, yeah, integer, integer, I don't know what you say in English. Uh, but that's very important. Let the judge decide. Expired, check some open tools. The, the one that I can really recommend, Kali. Kali is, uh, uh, well, here are some others. It's also fun to read the SIM. There's uh, cheap SIM readers. Get your SIM card. Thank you for your attention. See you tomorrow.